Oh, I'm sorry. We got, we got to do this one more time. Welcome everyone to uh, Hypnosis Rising Presentation Desensitization in Detail. Um, I, as I said, I'm going to be recording this presentation tonight for po uh, posting up on the internet so that those that were unable to attend tonight can still benefit from the material here. Um, would appreciate any, uh, if you find this to be valuable, would appreciate it if you would take the trouble to comment on the event. And when I post the, uh, the recording on the uh, hypnosis practice and uh, practicums um, group, if you would comment on it so that people would have uh, their attention drawn to it is something that would be valuable for them to, to, to view. So um, with that said, let's go ahead and let's begin the presentation. So tonight's presentation is called Desensitization in Detail. And what you're gonna find um, is that in the course of the presentation that I really see this as being the foundation of self-improvement. Um, it, it's something which is a, a bedrock of Capacity and hypnotherapy. Um, and I consider it to be a great gift to us. It's subtle in figuring out how to apply it and the conditions under which to apply it is subtle because it dep you, you know, in order to make the right choices, you really have to understand what the brain is trying to accomplish in the specific circumstances under which a limiting behavior is established in the mind. And that controls how we go about choosing to frame the desensitization process. The basic sequence of suggestions that you go through is the same in each of those contexts. The critical thing is how it's framed and how we walk through the process to, to, to attain extinction of the limiting behavior and to enable the client to replace it with the behavior which they find to be more rewarding or more fulfilling to them. So um, in, in um, then for, you know, looking at this problem in this way, I, I want to thank all of you for your commitment to this most creative of disciplines uh, what we do is to give people power over their own minds. And um, this has been a quest of mine for quite a long time in life. I am profoundly procreative. And that means that I believe that every person, regardless of the circumstances of their coming to the world, should have the opportunity to choose who they are. And this is what we do. And even more so than that, I believe that it's very important that we empower people to make active and informed choices about how life is brought into the world. And that if they're being asked to commit their entire being to the process of bringing life into the world, that that should be a creative act, not a random act, not an act in which they are subject to the brutality of another person or to the desire for control, but an intelligent choice. And to those of you who are here today who are in shock about what is happening with regards to that right in our country right now, my profound apologies to you for the way in which the tradition that I value so deeply and try the best to live my life by the code of Christianity has been manipulated to achieve the elimination of that right, at least over the next few months. So I hope that we can agree that uh, creativity is the most important goal of the work that we do to empower people to be creative and not constrained by, um, by the history that preceded them but to be able to move forward confidently to invest their energies in ways that they believe will lead to really rewarding outcomes, not just for themselves, but for all the people that they love dearly. So with that soapbox out of the way, um, let's look at the outline for today's presentation. So, um, you know, where do limiting reactions arise from? And we're gonna talk about the psychology and significance of the desensitization process within the framework of that psychology. We're gonna talk about how reactions and uh, limiting reactions are formed specifically through habits and trauma. And we'll look at 
how those differ in terms of the way that the brain kind of internalizes them. Uh, with that in place, we're gonna then switch to looking at therapy. And, and the therapy begins with the cognitive portion of the session. And there's several things that we need to make sure that we present to the client in terms of preparing them to receive the benefits of desensitization. That includes evaluating the nature of the emotional response or the emotional reaction, which is causing them to exhibit the limiting behavior. It's educating them about what's going on in the brain. And it's empowering them to recognize that they can change. And this all happens in the cognitive portion. And then we'll go through the trance work because there's a lot of framing for the desensitization process. You know, desensitization is very heavily based in the law of reverse action, which means that we need to establish that as a known to the subconscious, a pattern which is known to the subconscious. It's very beneficial at least to do that in a context in which that process is not learned at the same time as they're confronting a really powerful emotional response in which they can be overwhelmed. And once that's done, and we've kind of looked at the foundational uh, trance work, well, I'll, we'll then, you know, look at the actual specifics of desensitization itself. And that'll be a handout that I'll post in the chat and we'll probably have a break at that point in time. So if people wanna go and print it out, they can go and they can do that and they can scribble some notes on it. So let's look at the psychology and significance of desensitization. So we have two kinds of behaviors. We have subconscious conditioned reactions which are not built upon reasoning. It's not something that we necessarily think about doing when we do it. I'm doing this because it's just what we do. And there's two kinds of conditioned reactions. One of which is classical conditioning, which is based upon the law of association. So Pavlov's dog, you have a dog, you present a bowl of food, it, it, it salivates. You have a dog, you ring a bell, it doesn't salivate. Now you ring the bell at the same time that the, the food is presented, the dog salivates, of course, because the food's there. But it, what it turns out is that later on through the law of association, when you ring the bell, the dog salivates because it's expecting food to be shown at the same time. So that's one form. That's, that's the most primitive form of conditioning, um, just, just, a, just a law of association. There's another form of conditioning, which is called operant conditioning, which is that you create a, a, a kind of a situation in which there's a reward or a cost for for uh, achievable in this situation. And there's certain resources lying around and the creature kind of explores and manipulates the resources and eventually hits on some combination of actions which either avo avoids the cost or achieves the reward. And from that point forward, they can either adapt their behavior so that they can achieve, achieve the desired goal every single time, or if they, determine that they cannot control the outcome. They're not capable of doing that. And particularly if there's a cost imposed, they enter a condition called anomy. And, and the significance of anomy is very important in human behavior. It shows up a lot in chronic, chronic stress situations. So I just wanna make sure that we understand this. The classical experiment for, for anomy is in, in operant conditioning is you have two cages with rats in them. In both cages, you're able to apply an electrical shock. In one cage, the rat can press a button and prevent the shocks from happening for some period of time, like you know, a minute or three minutes or something like that. So it knows that for some fixed period of time, it's not gonna get a shock. On the second cage, there is no such button. Now what happens is you set things up so the rats always get the same number of shocks. It's just that the rat in the second cage will sometimes get them really close together. The rat in the first cage is perfectly normal. Goes about exploring, eating, you know, playing with, with other rats when it has them around, it's fine. The rat in the second cage that has no control lies on the floor and just quivers, anticipating that there's gonna be a shock coming. So this is a, a situation where, where we need to be sensitive to a, a situation where a client is in this condition. It's very important 
because when they are in that condition, there's certain signs that we need to look for. They are probably out of scope for therapy, or you need to proceed very, very carefully with them and do a lot of groundwork to prepare them to confront whatever emotion is driving them into their limiting behavior because there may be just a whole lot underneath that. That limiting behavior may be, in fact, a defense against something which is really, really powerful. Confrontation is something really powerful. So we'll, we'll get about that a little bit later on. Then we have conscious chosen responses. These are things where when we do them, we know why we're doing them. And when somebody asks us, why are you doing that? We say, oh, it's because of this. Okay. And there's two categories of these conscious chosen responses. And as I talk about in the modernizing the theory of mind, the second category of design was just Dr. Kappas would really, really love this. <laughs> okay, logic analysis, reason, decision making, willpower. Okay, and 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 there are there are people who are really good at doing this. They tend to make lots of very complicated rules and designs, but it starts with the theory, and then you plan a sequence of events and then you execute it. And the really nice thing about design is it's very very predictable. You kind of know what the outcome is going to be. The problem is when the plan fails, it's a catastrophe. And there's usually very little resilience in the system for people to shift direction and go a different way and, and solve the problems themselves. Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a um, um, cost function between optimization or predictability and resilience. Unfortunately, we're seeing that a lot in our country right now as climate change unfolds, but that's another political soapbox that I don't want to get on right now too, too much. But okay, but it turns out that most of the world lives the first category. Most of the world lives stories and analogies. And the stories that you pick depend upon how you identify with the characters in the story. So a girl might identify with the frog prince story if she thinks that she's a princess. And he was kind of raised with that view of, you know, feminine, feminine, little feminine perfection and everything like that. And daddy's little girl and every, that kind of business. Or it might be the ugly duckling. Each story might have a very powerful impact upon a, 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 a woman as an adult, depending upon who she was and who she identified with as a girl. And the great thing about stories is that there's a huge amount of flexibility. You get to pick which character you are in the story. You know, a boy might hear the frog print story and, hey, that's just like the ugly duckling. You know, if I am of service to somebody that I have a crush on, you know, eventually she might like me, you know, and so let's stick to, let's stick to our guns. Let's be a person of character. Okay. But, and, but the other thing that happens is that if, if you meet somebody and you think that they fill the other part in the story and they choose not to fulfill that part, they're not acting according to the role. Okay, well, you go and you find somebody else or you change the story. You decide to follow a different story. You go looking for a different story. And people change their stories all the time. And we have a very rich set of stories available to us from the media right now. It turns out that more people live stories than do design. And this is something that, that we need to be sensitive to. We need to give people a narrative about how their limiting behavior evolved, how it might have served them. So it's not, it's not that there's something wrong with you, okay? And you hear this a lot when you do, do the, the um, fear and phobia, uh, when you watch the case history, uh, the case histories in the, in the HMI catalog, okay? Normalization. Okay, making certain that they feel like it's okay to be who, that they, who they are, and that this is actually something that's gonna help you grow. This is something I always emphasize when I'm doing desensitization. This difficulty that you're struggling with, once you learn to master it, will give you strength that people that haven't faced this kind of difficulty simply won't have. So let's just remember what the state of the mind is for the clients that we're working with in most cases. Okay, we've got the conscious mind, which has got your thinking, rational self, your social identity, your I, that interacts with society, which is dangerous. So that we put a barrier up called the critical mind, which prevents society from dumping garbage into our mind, which becomes 
unverified knowns that didn't change our behavior and expose us to all kinds of danger. So the critical mind is there to protect us from deception and manipulation by society. Okay, and underneath that we have uh, our knowns and unknowns. We have our behaviors. We have the kind of euphoria and fear emotional reactions that help us to sort our knowns into categories. And the big challenge for many of us is that sex doesn't turn on until this divide in the mind occurs. So we have our survival behaviors deep down from childhood, which worked for us in the context of our childhood. And, the, and then that time is we're taught, you know, by Dr. Kappas, the mind was completely united. There was no division. But then what happens is we get this break of the mind into two parts when we're about eight to 10 years old. And then we hit puberty and sex turns on. And now there's, we're just totally whacked out. The mind is disconnected between what society is telling us about romance and what our hormones are telling us. And it's total chaos. And this is part of the reason why we have so much freaking trouble with relationships. So this is, this is the mind of the client at the time they come to us. Now, the goal of the vision that I have for hypnotherapy is that Ideally, what we would like to do is to dissolve this barrier <laughs> and get back to that childlike state. And the model for this that I emphasize and work with my clients is that in the thinking part of your mind, you evolve discernment and you act with dignity, which means that you don't do things that damage your body or that overstress your body. And you act with integrity, which means that you only do things that comport with your values. And you're patient enough and wise enough not to jump at an opportunity like you know, a hound running after a bunny rabbit, okay? You, you, you have got this under control. And we, we interact with society through the barrier of our of virtues and vices. Virtues are things that create social connection which in, and, and make us feel like we're safe within our community, that if we have a struggle in our life, that there will be people that are there to help us. And our vices are those things where we just say, I need to just, I need to be me for a while. Okay. And I'm sorry. I know I'm breaking my promise to you, but I'm going to go off and binge, binge watch something because I need to be who I am right now. And I'm, I'm just worn out with trying to be a we right now. I'm gonna, I need to separate and be myself. So vices aren't necessarily something that's negative unless they become chronic and, and, and overwhelm our virtues. But this is the model that I always point. This is the narrative that I'm leading my clients towards. Okay? The reason that you're struggling is because your mind's broken into two parts. And part of what we're doing together in our work is trying to soften that divide so that you are more integrated and complete as a person. Okay, so where does conscious choice come from? It comes in the prefrontal cortex. And here's this picture of the brain. The box shows where the prefrontal cortex is. It's your third eye. It's right behind, right behind your forehead. This is the seat of Freud's superego, or what I call the self-concept. It only really begins to be active around 10 years of old in a coherent way. Now, remember, we had that picture of the thinking mind and the two emotional centers. Okay, and what's happening is before you get the split in the conscious mind when you're a child, your parents try to fill you with understanding your thinking mind so that you can balance out euphoria and fear. What I like to say is you can't be the child that tastes the frosting in every cupcake at the party because he wants to find the perfect one, nor can you hide under the bed when the guests, guests come. Okay, you had to have to have balance between those two things in your mind. And the, the prefrontal cortex or the self-concept is the third leg of all of the mental balance stools in the mind. You have these, the mind has these poles built into it, okay? And the prefrontal cortex is the self-regulatory mechanism that gives us control over the state and the resources that we apply to solving the problems that we solve. It's quiescent during sleep, which is why we don't remember our dreams. Okay, so in order to access memories, we have to trigger them with the inputs that were active during the memories. And if this prefrontal cortex is turned off when you're dreaming, okay, then what happens is when you wake up, it's busy and active and you can't reproduce those same set of firings that were active when you were dreaming. And so you can't get at your dreams. This is a very important mechanism in terms of dealing with trauma. 
Now, between the prefrontal cortex and the rest of the brain sits the anterior cingulate cortex. And what this does is this mediates and connects the other parts of the brain up to the prefrontal cortex. And what happens is that this part of the brain can send connections just about everywhere. The brain is very plastic. And so what happens is the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex can actually go through and affect the behavior of all the rest of the brain. And this is what we're doing with desensitization. We are giving this part of the brain the ability to step in and regulate limiting behaviors to prevent them from coming to full realization. So how does that work? Okay, vagus nerve, let's look at the case of panic. Okay, fight or flight, panic. Okay, so the thing is that all the brain always does affects its action by sending signal paths to carry signals to neurons or to tissues. But it turns out that on certain parts of this, the central nervous system, those long lines, the axons, they carry those signals to the other part of the body that the brain is, that, this, that the neurons trying to affect. It can, it can add in myelin. And that can increase the flow of the signal by up to 100 times. Now, the vagus nerve mediates organ activation during fight or flight. But it has two fibers. There's an unmyelinated fiber that arises in the brainstem. And that part of the brain always knows about danger first. And there's a myelinated fiber arising from the cortex, okay, the more sophisticated part of the brain. So what this means is that you're always going to start that panic response. But because the cortex gets information from the organs faster and sends control information faster down to them, it can tamp it down and shut it off when it's not working for you. This is exactly what we're doing in desensitization. We're not attempting to turn off the panic response. Panic can be a really necessary and essential response to stimulus. <laughs> Okay, you know, when 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 the uh, when the when the um, rat, when the angry dog is is running after you, you know, it's it's get away. You don't want to turn that off, but what you want to do is create this ability of the thinking mind to discern and to intervene to prevent this from running out of control, and that's what desensitization does. Okay, any questions so far? Because this is going to take some time to get through. Is everybody okay with what's been with 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 this part of the psychology of desensitization at this point in time? Good and clear? Yes. I'm really enjoying it. Okay. I'm good. Okay. So now the issue is that quite often, as we know, a limiting reaction is a defense. And the role for defenses in therapy is you always want to provide a replacement. And one of the things that happens in, in, in classical hypnotherapy, and one of the things I'm really trying to emphasize in all the presentations that I make, is that a stronger self-concept is, in part, at least a, a replacement. Okay? I had a misconception about the world. I had lack of self-esteem. I am inserting into my mind that I am a constructive, dedicated, caring person, okay? And given that I accept fully and, I, and we transmit those, that self-evaluation down deep into the subconscious, okay? And say that this is what's really most important. To make the conscious mind happy, this is what's most important, okay? That's now allowing those connections to be built. And though that's the replacement, that actually a higher self-concept is a replacement for a limiting reaction. So um, the thing is that this is all very complicated in terms of 
the limiting reaction part. Okay. So here's the subconscious on the left side of the screen and the right side with the PFC ACC, that's, that's the conscious mind on the right side of the screen, okay? But there's several things that go on to, to get a limiting reaction going. You have some kind of a sensation, some stimulus coming in from the outside world, then the subconscious interprets it. And then you get the reaction based upon its interpretation, okay? Now, the thing is that whether or not the self-concept is aware of all of this stuff is a big question. And habits, it may not even be aware that you're pulling your hair out, okay, until about two hours later and you look in the mirror and, or two months later or two years later and your hair is all gone on that side of your head, okay? It, you may not even be aware that you're doing what you're doing, okay? You may not be aware of the interpretation. The foundational event of that metabolic collapse when you were in the elevator may not, you know, that may never have percolated up to the subconscious. Oh gosh, I was really hungry. Okay. So when you go into the into the elevator, there's an interpretation of being in an elevator, which is that this means metabolic collapse. Okay. Client may just be completely unaware of that. And the reaction, okay, the look on the face may simply not be something that the client is aware of. We just have somebody else join? Okay. Um, so what happens is we have to, sometimes we've got to step in and actually get in here and activate I'm sorry, get in there and activate awareness of what's going on. So this is an important thing that we have to do, okay? The client may have been told by somebody else, you know, you're doing this and it's really hurting you, okay? And they have no clue when it's happening. Okay, it's just something that goes on, okay? So, so we may have to prepare them and give them some sensitization so that, so that they're aware that, you know, these muscles are beginning to move. If they're if they're very if they have very very low ego ego sens sens sensitization or ego awareness, we may have to spend a lot of time with progressive relaxation to build that ego awareness. Okay, before we can even begin to deal with the rest of this problem. So it's being conscious of that. Okay. Then once this is all done. What happens is that the first step in suppressing or in, in removing and replacing the limiting reaction is always to be certain that the prefrontal cortex knows exactly what's going on. You don't want to just go in and suppress panic. We need to find the right place in this sequence to say we need to stop the reaction here. So for example, in sensation, there may have been no, no sensitizing event. There may have been no, no elevator. There may have been no car crash. It may just be that they grew up in a high stress environment. And so epigenetically, they've been conditioned to operate metabolically at a very high level. And we need to get them to the point where they can push beyond that level and have this limiting reaction come into them to make certain that that panic still can work and perform its natural function in all other conditions. So the first step, and you hear about this a lot in addictions, is that when you're trying to control an addiction, the craving gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And the best story about this, I was told by someone who was a, a weight loss counselor, and she said that she had a client that craved ice cream and just ate ice cream and ice cream, and they were getting it under control. And the woman had this day where she went into the supermarket and she got a shopping cart and she filled the cart up with ice cream and she found herself wheeling it up to the checkout counter and she said, what am I doing? And that was the end of the craving. And unfortunately, her uh, decision was to leave the ice cream in the cart and leave the <laughs> supermarket. So, you know, I, I don't know what happened to, um, 
the uh, what kind of a puddle they had to clean up eventually uh, from the ice cream being left in the supermarket or in the, in the shopping cart. But but this is part of what we get into, and this is why we do repetitions in desensitization. Okay, it's to be able to build up the reaction that that limiting reaction and turn it off multiple times so that the PFC and the ACC are getting exact to the right circuits. So you always start with awareness and activation. And that activation should be as fine grained as possible. We'll talk about some of the reasons for that later on. And then what happens is you turn it off. And what actually is happening in the neurons is they're switching over from a stimulating neurotransmitter to emission of gamma aminobutyric acid, which is the universal suppressor of signal transmissions. Question. Then after that, we offer the replacement. We've given them control, we suppress, and then we offer the replacement at the end of therapy. So this is why I call this the foundation of self-improvement. And this is part of the reason why desensitization is so complicated is because there's so much going on in this system. All right, yes, Laura. So on the activate, can you explain that a little bit more? I think I so, might've lost it when I was following along the other stuff. Oh, sure, sure. So what happens is, the first step in, 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 in controlling any limiting reaction is to know how to trigger it, right? And then you confront okay. the brain with going down that path and then you give it an alternative, okay? And so what we're gonna do in desensitization is we're just conditioning the brain to go down a different path, okay? And it's the chosen response of the clients. The, what the, the, the subconscious, whenever it gets to the point where it's confronting the trigger, it's always gonna ask the conscious mind, okay, I'm gonna do this instead, is that okay? And clients talk about this, that when, it's only when they actually confront the manager coming to the office that that, that vision of him in the diaper comes up and they're okay. <laughs> Okay. So we're active. So we're activating it as a therapist in the ways of like, okay, imagine you're at that point, you know, where they right. start to have, feel that. Right. And, well, okay, and, and, that's, and that's part okay. of the complexity of desensitization is the framing okay. under different situations. You want to do the activation differently. And if you pick the mm -hmm. wrong way, the, the, the results can be really bad. Okay. Yeah. And this is Are not there... just, are there different ways of activating? I mean, like, do you have like a breakdown of kind of that yes. aspect or? Yes, okay. well, yes, okay. yes, that's the handout. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I okay. would have had All 500 right. view graphs <laughs> if I would have tried to do it here. So that's why I have the handout. I so know. Like, oh my God, a, yeah, there's so many pathways through here. Okay. Good. Uh, okay. This is not going to happen. Okay. Anybody, no, anybody else? You. Anybody else? Can you take your hand down then, Laura? Thank you. Okay. So that's the end of that section. Any questions so far, are we good? All right. So reaction formation, how do these limiting reactions get established? Habits. So abstractly, I'll get to this in a minute, but let's get an example. Grandma's cookies, okay? So you're growing up, you're a little kid, you need lots of energy, you're running around all the time. Cookies are love. Whenever you see a cookie, you put it in your mouth. You get to be 45 and you see a cookie, you put it in your mouth and it turns to fat in your body and now it's no longer functional. Now it's a limiting behavior. You got to get that under control, okay? So you can get limiting behaviors formed just through habits. So it's a previously functional behavior, cookies are love, and the automatic response to eat the cookie because you're told it's okay to eat the cookie, grandma loves you, and this is good for you and everything like that. It's a response, it's something you're taught to do, but eventually it becomes a habitual reaction. You don't think about, I'm with grandma, and so it's okay to have cookies, even though it's not okay at home. It, later on, when you leave home, you just eat the cookies all the time anyways, okay? It's now a, a habitual reaction. This is one of the things about the, about the partnership between the conscious and subconscious mind. When you're learning to handwrite, you're thinking about it and you're training your muscles and everything like that. But once you learn how to do it, you're, it's in your subconscious. Okay. So even our chosen responses eventually become habitual reactions. They're coded down in our subconscious. 
okay? Then circumstances change. And you might not realize that the problem exists in that habitual reaction. And so what you do, you know, because you need to be able to handwrite. So what you do is you compensate. You evolve new behaviors to adjust for the dysfunctionality of the way that you handwrite. Okay, you, instead of printing, you need to do cursive. You, you compensate for it in some other way. Okay, and so you build layers and layers of compensation as through the course of your life until it finally becomes unsustainable. And so now we want to go into therapy. They come into us for therapy to preempt the habit with their preferred response. But that could be one of the compensatory habits at the very high level. So one of the things you get into with habit management is peeling the onion to get down to the foundational issue. And this is classical. If you, if you take uh, Susie's EFT or take her um, weight loss course, okay? It's just, it's just, it could be really, really complicated um, to, uh, to, to peel the onion and get down to the foundation of what's going on. Give me just a second here. I've got to turn on some air here. It's getting pretty hot in the room here. So just give me just a second. Okay, let's go on to the next thing. Oops. Trauma. So let's just understand what trauma is and have a definition of it. So trauma occurs because you have a crisis and there's that initial moment where we feel paralyzed is where is something's changed, we need to do something different. And then there's this huge swing of energy that comes out of our body as we deal with the acute symptoms of the situation try to stabilize and get to a safe, safe environment. And then there's a response which carries on for some extended period of time where we need to kind of piece things back together and get our life back in order. But if this response drags on for long enough, this is the enemy situation that I talked about about the rat in the cage, we give up and collapse. And when we finally start moving again, we're not able to summon the same amount of energy. And this can be for psychological reasons. It can be for physiological reasons, okay, that we get into this state. So what's going on here in this process is you have a sensitizing experience, something in the person's past that was recognized and known, okay, or sensitizing conditions. You're involved with the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, which is the fight or flight system where it's not just you know it, this is this gives you a system-wide reaction the the vagus nerve doesn't affect everything that's involved but but so you get these hormones going around the system you transition to the sympathetic metabolic state fight or flight and eventually you collapse into hyper suggestibility and so we need to recognize when clients are coming to us with the limiting behavior that one of the side effects may be that they are in an environmental hypnosis and that that barrier and the division of responsibility for the, between the conscious and subconscious mind may have broken down. We need to recognize when that's happening. And then one of the things that we do in hypnosis, of course, as Dr. Kappas teaches it, uh, us, is that we take them deeper into hypnosis and bring them out. And then the conscious mind begins to recognize it as being reactivated and begins to resume its function in a normal way. And we give them the capacity to count themselves out when they recognize that they are going into trance. Okay, so this, this again can make, this can be a precursor to, to desensitization in some situations. Now we need to, I spoke about recognizing uh, and differentiating and being sensitive to the state of the client and, 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 and being capable of recognizing when they are behaving in ways that are potentially out of scope, okay? So not infrequently when you're dealing with 
trauma and desensitization is when you talk about their, you know, that transition into that, uh, into that uh, limiting behavior, they're not in the room. Okay, their eyes stare off into space, they're vacant. Okay, it may take them time to respond to your questions. There are other situations where they get flooded and they're just, it's just a word spewing out of them. Okay, and they can't stop talking. Okay, so this is a situation where pacing, leading and pacing, very, very important. Okay, to meet their energy and slow them down. Okay. Now, in the case of dissociation, you know, you can ask them where they are. What's going on right now? What are you feeling? Okay, when they're flooding, they're just, they're just in an out of control state. There's so many feelings that they can't, they can't break them all down. Okay, and so you have to back them out so they can recognize the feelings and the layers of the feelings that they're under. They're just overwhelmed by feeling. The last category is, is more difficult, it's submission. This is someone who's convicted that they don't matter. Okay, and one of the things that we need to be very careful about in this situation is not to force them to come out to us. Don't try to look them in the eyes. You know, don't reach out and touch them. What you do in this situation is you give them space, you breathe, and you put your shoulders back and sit up straight and look off to the side of them. And you wait for them to come out and you ask them, can you just pull your shoulders back and open up and be with me right now? or be present with yourself right now, not be with me. It's always trying to get them to change their relationship to their body. Quite often when they're in this state, it is, it is very, it's very, very sensitive work and it may be out of scope. It may be that they really need to see a psychologist or a psychotherapist because they're in a state of freeze where the brain is shut down. And there has to be something established in the self-concept before they can recognize they're going to that state and intervene. Now, I've been successful with clients like this, okay? Um, but they weren't coming out of an immediate trauma, okay? It was a trauma from a long time ago and they, they were independent adults and they'd already developed some sense that they could be successful navigating the world, okay? So this is a very sensitive situation to work with. And um, as I said, I, I, I am very, very careful in working with clients like this. So the strategies here, uh, we need to have strategies for normalization. It's okay not to be in the room. We understand that you're out of control. This is a normal reaction in establishing rapport with the client. Very important to be able to be with them in whatever state they are and guide them out of that state. To a, to a place where, where, where they are in the room and recognizing that they are in the presence of someone who is offering them support. So let's look at acute trauma. In acute trauma, metabolic collapse, you know, that old hypoglycemic reaction, injury or violence, even witnessing violence, okay? The subconscious intervenes in the situation to restore safety. And that means that whatever it does under those circumstances, those reactions are deeply internalized and have high value and weight in its decision-making processes. For that reason, the subconscious ruminates on the experience. If you read about trauma and dreams, one of the things that they find is that the subconscious is working this over every single day, every single night almost. It's trying to figure out how to, how to, how, how can I, if that ever happens again, how can I protect myself? Okay. And there's a very significant shift 
in the dreams just before people re achieve full recovery and are able to resume normal lives. And that's, they go, in the dreams, they go from being a passive to an active participant. So this is where the subconscious does its rumination and dream processing every single night. Okay, and so you get into situations where if I can't find a solution, you get, you get insomnia, people wake up in the middle of the night. So don't be surprised at this, you know, in situations of acute trauma, that this is a problem. And one of the things that we can do is teach people, you know, breathing techniques that enable them to restore calm. Mindfulness is to where they recognize that they're in a safe environment. Because what happens is the beautiful thing about the subconscious in this regard is that when you're dreaming at night, you are not producing the neurotransmitter that mediates anxiety and fear. And so whatever fear they have when they're ruminating on that experience is related to residual or driven by residual concentrations in the cerebral spinal fluid that's left over from the day. So if you can give them a sense that they're safe during the day, eventually the dream will pass forward to the venting stage and be released. And this is something that we facilitate in dream therapy. Chronic trauma, dependency and abuse. So you are a person who is vulnerable to another individual who is unable to uh, respect the boundaries of your personality. Fortunately, in this situation, while there are sensitizing conditions, there quite often is no single sensitizing event. Okay, it's just a, a something you got to learn to live with. Okay. And one of the challenges here is that because the only thing that we can control is ourselves, quite often we identify with the conditions, with the chronic conditions, and we internalize them as shame and guilt. So obviously, young children in stages two and three of development are particularly susceptible to these kinds of problems. And you can use, if, if, if they don't know where they're why they're doing what they're doing. And you, and, 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 you know, there's some evidence that they've had a long history of, uh, of, of kind of sketchy behavior that's not functional for them. You can listen to how they talk about their problem and see whether they say there's something wrong with me or there's something wrong with what I did. Or stage four, the world is out to get me. Okay, or, or, or it's all the fault of the person that was telling me what to do. If it's just, you can't trust anybody in the world, that's getting to a really fundamental low level. Okay, that's getting to, to the very first stage of development. Okay, and if they, if, if they had a fairly normal life and they're broken down to that level of, of just like, I can't trust the world. Okay, I tend to want to get a psychotherapist involved or a psychiatrist. You know, there's just a lot of stuff that's got to be rebuilt at that point in time. And, and in the rebuilding process, they have to go through shame and guilt on the way out the door. And that's just a really vulnerable place to be in. Okay. And so somebody who can anticipate with the sequence of events and ensure that they have medication if they need it in order to keep them when they hit that speed bump. Okay. I, I, I tend to be very careful in this situation. Now, as well as what happens here is unfortunately because you don't have any control over the environment around you, there's some really important functions in the self-concept which are underdeveloped in, in this situation. That's rational planning and, and who you are as an individual, that the self-concept is weak. So what we wanna do with people like this is I always start with, you know, you made it this far. So what have you been doing right? What is it in you that has empowered you to become the person that you are? Because there's a lot of good in you if you've got to this point. And really celebrate that and get that lifted out and on paper. And I use it in therapy and the desensitization therapy. Okay, any questions on this section? We all good with this? Okay. 
Yes. Thank you. Okay, so let's go to the cognitive groundwork. We now have a client here in therapy with us in the room. How do we go about kind of laying things out here and kind of navigating this? Oh my God, Brian, it really, this desensitization have to be this hard. Okay. Um, but what I'm going to do first is I'm going to get the, uh, the handout here and make sure that you can all can see it and access it. Um, Oh, I didn't put that here. How do I go back up? Ah, oh, that's how. Okay, I put it here in partners. Each of my grads. Okay. Oops. <laughs> it won't let me do that because the file's open because I was going to share it to my screen later on. Let's try this again. Okay, can you all see that in the in the chat? Okay, go ahead and grab it. Make sure that you can get to it. And I'll close this thing and pull it back up so that I can have it on the screen when I go through it. So many details. Okay. I don't see it in chat. You don't? Does anybody else see it in chat? I don't see it. I don't see it. Nothing. Okay. I grabbed it from chat. I downloaded oh, it. Weird. Well, Patricia, you got to put it back everyone? in the chat now because you took the only one that no, was no, there. I, I didn't grab it. I just hit the download. <laughs> got it too. Yeah, yeah, I just hit the download. I didn't like take it. No, no, I'm teasing you. I'm totally oh, teasing you. I go. <laughs> <laughs> that shows how yes, confident yes it's play. actually it's actually a reaction test okay i set this whole thing up to see who is the fastest draw in the west okay so the rest of you failed you know <laughs> you, you need to leave hypnotherapy now um, can people get it or not now i'm wondering okay. i'm on a phone and i don't have it laura are you on a phone or yeah i'm you? on a phone also mm -hmm. so brian it did seems you like send maybe... it to everyone or did you yeah i sent it to everyone it? um okay but I'm thinking ta, 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 ta. because we're, some of us are on a phone, maybe we okay. the only thing, I'm on an iPhone 6, and the only thing I see in chat is Jessica saying, I got it. I got That's it. All I got okay. on I'm on iPhone 8, and I'm the same thing. <laughs> okay. So maybe so, it's the phone or somehow. Yeah, after. my concern hmm. is that if you've got it, if you're on a phone and I post it to the Facebook event, it's going to be uh -huh. just really a whole bunch of juggling. So what I need to do next time, I apologize for this. What I need to do next time is make sure that I have it up someplace where people can grab it before the event. So is there a I way that somebody that. on here can download it and maybe send it through? Like I'll put my email on there or something. Well, I'll I'll post it up. Email? I'll post it oh, up to okay. the group and when when we're done. Okay. Okay, it's okay. just that you won't be able to scribble on it when we're going through it. So I apologize. Okay, I've that's just okay. been, you know, there's 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 so many details right now and. I've just uh, was uh, wrapped up in um, global events this this evening, as you might have gathered. So, all right. So, let's talk about. We got to identify the behaviors. Remember, they may not even be aware of what the heck it is that they're going on. Okay, but we can categorize the behaviors, and 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 we need to to. There's certain of them that are, there's kind of a, 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 a hierarchy, okay, that we can kind of pursue here. First of all, we need to know if, if panic is involved, okay, if they're going into fight or flight in a really aggressive way. Um, and, and sometimes you can, you know, and the handwriting analysis course gets into this at, at some level as well, which is that you can have people that are explosively angry, okay? And so when they come in and they start talking about this, there's some, there's some careful questions to ask about, you know, okay, so what set that off, you know? And, and some judgments to be reached about, you know, would a reasonable person have done that in that situation, okay? Or, or is this something which is conditioned very deeply in their personality? And when we get into the subconscious, it's gonna come out and we're gonna be a target in the room. Okay, so so there is there is some some extreme cases here we need to be careful of, which is which is explosive uh, aggression or explosive um, anger. 
But um, so there's there's aggression and there's paralysis, okay, where they they're in a social circumstance. They know that they can't run away, but they can't do anything, and so they become subjected to other people's will. Okay, so so we need to identify panic. That's one aspect of things. We know that that's all being run by the vasovagal nerve. Okay, then there's anticipation. So panic normally arises when you're in the actual situation. Okay, there's a there's a physical experience that you're in. You're receiving actual stimulus, and you get this panic. Okay, anticipation is quite often imagined when you think about the situation, and you can get into a, 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 a state of anxiety or worry where you're thinking about the worst case all the time or you're paranoid about other people and unable to accept their support and collaboration. So this is, this is a whole nother set of zones where you get into desensitization. Let's build tolerance to frustration through desensitization. Let's let that thought pattern get established and then let's let it pass, okay? All of this is the subject of desensitization. Now, then there's the triggers. Once you've got kind of the basic pattern of what's going on, there's the triggers. What causes it to happen? And trying to get a suds ranking on the triggers. This is particularly important for anticipatory, uh, for anticipatory for phobias. Okay, so we'll get into later on down the road. But you wanna know this in general because quite often what happens is when you're trying to, if the person has a weak self-concept and can't talk about their virtues and their strengths, then what you can do is say, okay, so when this happens, take a level four one, when this happens, okay, what's going on inside of you? How are you thinking? So you're getting to vices and flaws and you can turn those around and say, you may want the opposite of this in your character, right? It's really important that you develop something that counteracts this weakness in you, okay? So let's, let's, let's build on that, okay? And in some cases, you can, if they don't know that, if it never manifested that quality in the real world, you know, one of the things that Lisa likes to do is, you know, pick your avatar, you know, Mr. Spock or, or Albert Einstein or Gandhi or something like that. And, and they become the subconscious image of this virtue. Okay, so, so, we, so, so, so it's by analyzing kind of like their vices and their flaws, we can actually, even though that can be brutal work, we don't want to do that necessarily in the worst possible situation, but kind of one where they feel they can almost handle it, okay, and begin to change their self-concept. And that gives them the belief that they can change and that con confidence then uh, makes them able to take on the bigger challenges later on. Um, but the consequences also need to be assessed. Are they practical consequences that le may lead to actual physical danger? Or are they primarily moral consequences? Do they feel guilt? Do they feel shame? And this therefore makes them unable to receive the gifts that the world is offering them. Okay. So this is, the, this, is, this is an assessment to be done. And I don't do this on the fly, okay? This is complicated. You get enough in the, init in the, in the initial consultation, okay? To kind of get a sense as to what the lay of the land is. And you go when you sit down and you think about the questioning process. And I'm always, when I'm dealing with this kind of situation, I'm always trying to have a plan before I go into this because it is complicated. So one of the things that, that you always have to do when working in this space, okay, it's not winging it. You want to go in and you want to have enough information coming to this that you can pick through the possibilities and go through all the materials that, that, that you've been exposed to and kind of work a plan out. And when you do it enough times, then it becomes second nature. Okay. But I was I was doing this, you know, every single, every single, every single case in the beginning. Um, and I still do, I still try to do it because I think I do, I do a better job when I when I do this 
ahead of time. Okay, now then we want to explain to the client that there's two very important concepts that help us to deal with crisis in our lives. And when they're coming to us with a limiting behavior, it's become a crisis. The behavior itself may be a crisis. Okay, so we want to educate them regarding resilience. Resilience, there's been a big study on resilience and, and, it, and there's a lot of um, what I want to call um, slipperiness in the meaning of this term. Mine is drawn from the book Resilience, <laughs> okay? Where with a guy who's, who's talked about this, not just in terms of individual behaviors, but in terms of how nations respond to things like earthquakes and that kinds of business, okay? And, and the issue begins with awareness of the problem. How do you anticipate that it's going to occur? Rehearsing what you're going to do, making sure that you've got resources cashed around in a safe place to draw upon when the crisis occurs and being somewhat independent so that you're not wholly, wholly dependent upon one person. Because quite often the crisis in a relationship may be that you don't have any options when the crisis arises. And so you can't adapt, you can't accumulate resources, you can't rehearse and practice, okay? But these are things that we do for our clients, okay? We have to make them, you know, I talked about awareness early on. If they're aware of it, okay. So now when does it occur? What are the triggers? And you'll see them get activated when they're talking about the triggers. Okay, so let's practice our breathing. Let's just do some breathing right now. Controlling and slowing the pace of breathing tells the body that you're safe and it helps to dampen the, the, vasal, vagal, you know, the vasal vagal signals and you come out of fight or flight and you're able to see what's happening around you. You no longer tunnel vision on the problem. You can see the resources around you, okay? And you can choose to act. You can choose to block out what's meaningless and harmful to you and move towards what is, um, what is supportive of you. So you become more independent. So this model of what we're doing in part in, in, in that breathing exercise and other exercises that we do in the cognitive portion, and then we reinforce them in the trance state is we're helping the client to build resilience, okay? Very, very powerful concept. Now, the other thing that we can help them to do is to develop hardiness. And the thing is that the resilience typically, you know, with the ability to build friendships and relationships where you have choices and things like that, this is typically what I call an adventurer's virtue, what in HMI they would call a physis virtues. Okay, this is where they tend to be strong in crisis. Okay, they, they've practiced, they don't have to figure things out, they know what to do, okay? They're not designing it in real time like an emo. <laughs> Okay, and trying to optimize to the actual conditions. It's way too complicated. I'm sorry, Mr. Emo, you can't, you, you don't know what's happening at your neighbor's house. Okay, and they may come in and, and, and need something that, that you feel compelled to share with them. You can't hoard it. Okay, so, 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 so really seriously, resilience is, is, a, is a physics virtue. Hardiness tends to be an emo's virtue. Okay. Ownership, what I do makes a difference. And an emo is confident that they can create value. Learning, after every experience, I will be stronger than I was before. I will be more capable than I was before because I've been through that experience. I've learned something from it. And meaning is we are stronger than we were before. My learning, and this is where, if you read the book, Quiet, this is where introverts or emos really come into their own in the world to become passionate advocates. Is that what happened to them and what they discovered is of value to other people. And this is what turns that, that quiet little retiring, hiding the corner person into this tiger that goes out into the world and says, hear this, this is important, okay? 
So hardiness is again, something that we can develop. We can look at these questions, okay? Somebody who has a limiting reaction may not believe that what they do makes a difference. When we tell them, when I, when I ask them or you know, ask them to consider, you know, you've made it this far, there's something, there's something really strong within you, okay? Now they recognize that they've learned something. And when I tell them, when you learn how to bring that quality out into the world, that you're going to help everybody around you because you will know that you can go through really difficult situations and be better for it. And they will turn and rely upon you in those circumstances because you'll know that you can get through difficult things. So there's the meaning. And so we can, we can, we can, we can, part of the thing is, is just, you know, that whole thing of standing in that process with them and, and looking at their ability to get to where they are, helping to identify those qualities is building hardiness. Then we want to investigate the cause. Um, metabolic stability, you know, is a big one or hypoglycemic shock. Stages of development is, is very, very viable. I've said, as I said before, you know, they may have this thing that they're doing, there's so many behavior, which is the outer skin of the onion. But if you listen to their self-talk, okay, then what ends up happening is that uh, uh, sometimes you, what you do is you really pinpoint a stage of development that was incomplete. And so there's a crisis in the self-concept that you can address more directly in terms of what virtues to focus on, okay? All those accomplishments of, of autonomy, those are all virtues, okay? And you can come up with kind of near synonyms or something like that and really, and really give the client focus here, okay? Build this in your self-concept. You don't have to go back to the stage of development and say, what was the crisis there? Because what's important is it's incomplete. And they need to revisit it. Okay, so just tell them, hey, let's we need some of this virtue in your world. Okay, so let's drop it in there. The subconscious will dream about it. And it'll figure it out for itself. Oh, that's that's yeah. If I add that into that old situation that I'm still, my inner child is still wrestling with. Wow, that solved that problem. Vent it out in dream therapy. Kind of the universal dream therapy thing is any experience or emotion that inhibits the realization of this new self will be passed forward to the venting dreams just before waking in the morning and released to make room for new and more rewarding experiences in collaboration with those around you. Okay, just general all purpose venting dream suggestion. And then there's there's reframing. Um, again, that's that's the reframing thing there, which is to is to use that whole thing to guide you and look at that is is a source of virtues. That that if you can identify those, what would fix this problem for you? Okay, if you can get them to describe the, the qualities of character, then we're building up the self concept, which means that the PFC is stronger in this conflict with the with the conditioning the conditioned reactions in the subconscious, and it's able to actually tip things over and, and shift into the replacement behavior. Normalization is very important in many situations. This happens to a lot of people, okay? You're not the only person, and I've helped so many of them, okay? They, and they're stronger as a result. Rational analysis of risk can be a big thing, okay? I mean, how often do you actually have thunderstorms? How often do we have earthquakes, you know? When was the last time an atom bomb went off? You know, we, we, you know, whatever it may be, um, and those those are kind of trivial and kind of um, um, things that I hope hopefully we don't have too many clients coming to us with those kinds of things. But but the thing is that especially the atom bomb thing. But but the thing is that rational analysis of, re, of risk it's building up and giving ammo to this part of the mind when they get into confrontation and trance with that emotion which generates you know that that vision of that stimulus and the emotion that's generating the limiting reaction they've got more ammo when you tell them to turn it off 
yes, it's safe to turn this off, okay? Motivation, so always benefits. Once it's gone, what will your life be like, okay? It's, it's, it's way, it, it's really important. And this is part of the replacement at the end after extinction, okay? You wanna walk them through that new experience of life. Make it condition the subconscious to, the, to accept it as a no. Virtues and strengths, enumerating those. Resource state definition, okay? How will you feel when you've mastered this? Or what qualities would enable you to overcome and be strong in this situation? And in the resource state, we need an anchor, right? And that can be either a past experience. Ask them, you know, is this something that you're familiar with? You know, maybe when they are in the test, they can't do it, but they can in the basketball court. Okay, it's just giving them an anchor and an association. Um, Lisa likes to use exemplars or avatars. Okay, this is all stuff that we want to be able to do this as rapidly as possible. We want to have these assets available to us. Okay, so we got a decision point here because I've got more material than I can get through. Um, um, I can, well, no, wait a minute. We've been on for 40 minutes so far. That's right, I started at 7, 10. No, we've been on for 70 minutes so far. I've got about 35 minutes left. So um, I can pick up the pace a little bit here um, as we go through this in the trance work, a lot of this will be familiar to you. To you. You've seen it in the videos, the 401 videos, um, the fears and phobias courses. You've been through this. Um, you've seen it in case conference or in case history uh, sessions. You will see this if you go into the fears and phobias videos in HMI. You will see all of this stuff done. Okay. What I'm going to do is present to you, given all the stuff that we talked about before. I'm going to list out the sequence in which I do things, okay? And you'll see how all that information that I was talking about feeds into the trans work, okay? So we're going to have one big slide that talks about the big perspective of how we prepare, having gone through all this cognitive work, we're now got them in trance, and there's a series of steps that we're going to take in order to be able to condition them to get maximum advantage of the psychological processes of healing that the brain provides to be able to and to be able to empower them to actually do confront the activation to pass it and, and turn it off and then to accept the replacement at the end okay so let's go into the trance work i think i can pick up the pace here okay so the sketch is we need to release self judgment we need to activate the desired resource state. We establish an idiomotor indicator for the reaction. Okay, so that we can see when they've managed when they've managed to find that part of the subconscious that actually causes that reaction to be present within them. Okay, the conscious mind monitors this as the subconscious reacts. That's part of what the trans process is all about. And so we use a series of statements in the way that we formulate suggestions, okay? To give this conscious mind different perspectives on how this process is evolving in the subconscious. And the last time is try, okay? Really try to feel that emotion welling up within you, okay? So we're giving it an opportunity to actually exercise, okay? So we're height, we, we wanna you know, heighten awareness of what's going on, which focuses the prefrontal cortex. We do an idiomotor transition out of the reaction, suggesting the restoration of the resource state. So we're not just telling them to pass it. 
we're saying pass it and return. And if you have anchors for that, like breathing or that, turn your mind back to that experience in the basketball court or think of your avatar or your exemplar. Okay, you draw upon that to help them come in back into that resource state. Once that happens to PFC ACC, the circuit then switches to suppression. Okay, and particularly in that try at the very end. Okay, it's in charge of the whole process. And when you pass it there, it's now actually driving that and establishing that transition. Then at the very end, we assert the replacement. Visualize your life with family and friends and, and career. Now, now that you have this self-control, okay? Or imagine now that you can drive again, how much freedom and opportunity is awaiting you in the world. Okay, so you'll always assert the replacement at the end and you congratulate that stronger self-concept. So let's break this down into the specific conditioning. So in the cognitive breath work, you know, that breathing, you get that physical, emotional, and moral condition or intellectual state, you know, and they breathe and on the exhale, they do that. Those three things is their mantra, okay? Uh, you can also bring, bring their virtues into this, okay? So in the cognitive, we're, we're, we're doing this breath work thing. We're giving them an anchor and, and teaching them the anchor. We've done, we've looked at that and found their avatar, if it's necessary, their exemplar. We've got all that, all that information available to us. And we, 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 we put this all together in the breath work for them before we take them into trance. Progressive relaxation, perceptual awareness, okay? One of the things that, that I, I left out here that's, that can be very important is where are you feeling this in your body? As you go into this state, where are you feeling this in your body? Okay, and if they can't tell us that, this progressive relaxation is really important in terms of getting them back in touch with their body so they can talk about that. When it's done from the feet up to the head, it's also activating sequentially and turning attention to all, it, it basically grounds them in motor control at the feet and it rises up all the way through to doing things out in the world with the hands and reaching to the future, conceiving that future and creating with the hands, okay? So it's actually drawing them through the sequence of chakras, which is about the, the construction of the faculties of the mind that I talked about at the very beginning. So don't just think of the progressive relaxation as this kind of I'm making them relax so that they're ready to go to sleep, okay? This is a very, very, very powerful method. If you read The Transformation um, by Gilbert, I think is his name. This is a guy who's worked in mass trauma environments for decades. And the progressive relaxation is a foundational therapy in what he does. He calls it a body scan. It's not guided, okay? And he just teaches people to do this. And it starts in his case from the heart, I believe and goes outwards, okay? But in the way that the progressive relaxation is designed from the feet up, it is not just a, uh, a trivial kind of a relaxation thing and a, and a somatic awareness thing. It's actually a chakra activation, okay? And so, so don't discount this. It's important to do this. There was a question about secondary inductions um, and the students and grads group. And, and I try to emphasize this out there. It's, it, there's a lot more to the progressive relaxation than just getting somebody ready to go into trance. Okay, challenges. We want to establish reverse, reverse action. And a really great challenge is arm rigidity on a self-judgment, on lack of tolerance, on frustration, on guilt, you know, on some kind of particular self-judgment, okay? And so again, doing that arm rigidity where we're gonna, we're gonna move all of that judgment, whatever it is, into the hand. And if you're doing this over, the, uh, over video and you can't grab their elbow, okay, and, and get them into that condition and, 
and do all that kind of thing. What I tend to do is it's either, you know, clasping the hands in front and squeezing it between the palms, or it's pressing their hand down into the armrest until it's like melted in and they can't get it out, whatever the heck it is. But you count them down and then you do the reverse action. The, the more you try to, 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 let, uh, to, to, to let go of your, of your grip, the, the tighter and tighter your arms are, and, and you're squeezing that self-judgment even more tightly and tightly between the palms, then you take a deep breath and squeeze all of it out into the palms, and then you let ah. it go. You just let it go. Okay, but that's also preparing them for the for the challenge or for, for the release process. You are conditioning them to confront something in a physical way, and you're using your the physical relaxation of the body to let go of the emotion. So now they believe that they can let go. Really important to do this to get best effect. Okay, now that you've got them where they let go and they're really, really relaxed, you take them down deeper at that point in time. If it's the first session, you redo the post the post reaction suggestion for um, for re re rehypnotization. Then you do the breath work anger. Okay, let's now just practice that breathing. Return to that breathing, and, and you get them to do the mantra and tell themselves that they have these wonderful qualities. Okay, that they can be in this safe state. And you give them their their keyword or their anchor for use out in the waking world. And when this they use their anchor in the waking world, this will automatically happen in the in the, in the subconscious mind, and they will feel calm descending upon them, and they will feel these qualities with them. Okay. And then the last thing I do is always a staircase on their resource state, whatever they said they needed to get through. And the first time you always put them up at the top of the staircase. And they're looking at themselves from below. So that's the, up on the staircase is their self-concept. And you're walking this down to them, these wonderful qualities to give the subconscious what it needs. In those last steps, it's always, you can feel this warmth, the, this energy of these qualities permeating every cell in your body as it comes near and near. And with every step, it's doubling and doubling again and doubling again until zero deep sleep. Okay. So now they have this known within them of this reality of themselves to themselves. And some, some things that I sometimes use here is I say, and, and now feeling this within you and how right and natural it feels within you. You know that this is the self that is desired and therefore the self that is most true within you and therefore most real in expression to the outer world. So projecting that into that that replacement, projecting that forward, even before we do the desensitization. Okay, so now I'm going to bring up the. Any questions on this so far? Okay, Amy says she's exhausted. How's everybody else doing? Good. Should we should we should we press through for the last for the handout? I can do it. Okay. New screen share. We got 25 minutes. Oh, she couldn't kick through for 25 more minutes. Okay, so, uh, well, I got to figure out how to manage the Zoom territory so I can get this thing. Page width, can you read that? Okay. Yeah, you can pinch to uh, spread it so it's readable. Okay. So, theory. Desensitization reduces or extinguishes the limiting reaction. This outcome is achieved by empowering the self-concept to intervene or the conscious mind to intervene in the development of the reaction in the subconscious. All reactions are always subconscious, okay? So we don't wanna universally suppress the reaction, which may be a survival mechanism, 
Well, we want to enable the cortex to get in there and to use the speed of its signaling technology to kind of keep the reaction from blowing up into behavior that's unacceptable. Okay. So getting a little bit more into the detail, uh, I'm reiterating some of the things we said earlier, limiting reactions are triggered from the right brain, which scans the environment for threats and opportunities. This feeds into the amygdala, which interprets signals to produce an emotional response. It is that emotional response that drives the limiting reaction. So we use idiomotor indication on the left side of the body. Remember, left side of the body connects to the right side of the brain. So in order to get the maximal experience of, ex of, sense of, of exposure to that, to that you know, process, Okay, you want to do the finger on the left side of the body, or you can do the left hand raising or a fist or whatever the heck it is. Okay, just need to be something that you're sure that you can see. And there's some positioning to be done here to make sure that you can get this. And this is this can be the trickiest part I find. Okay, when you're doing, especially if somebody's doing zoom over a cell phone. Okay, getting things set up as to where and so, so you may need to really don't let yourself get caught out here. I've had this happen a couple of times, right? where the room got dark or something. I just couldn't see what the heck was going on. So I just went through the process by rote and assumed that what was happening was happening, but, but be careful here, okay? So we're gonna use idiomotor indication on the left side to get into the right side of the brain. And then we're gonna use breath work to release the reaction. And we established both in state as we described in the trance work. So for the idiomotor response, what I recommend is we are now going to learn to maintain self-control in difficult circumstances. Stances. To achieve this, we will use the left index finger, the raising of the left index finger to indicate when the limits of self-control have been reached. Okay. You can just tell them to raise their finger and lower. Let's just see that happening. Okay. So then we'll go through how we establish the reaction in the next session, because that's where these choices come in. There's these different paths based upon how this whole thing got, got established. Okay. And we need to be careful in that. The conscious process in the prefrontal cortex can examine the links between the stimulus and emotion. We have removed the critical mind. So now the conscious mind can see down into the subconscious, okay, and learn about what's going on down there. Way cool. Hey, aren't we great as hypnotherapists? Something nobody else can do. Actually, the psychotherapists do this, but they do it by exposure therapy to the initial trauma, which puts them into fight or flight. So they're actually in hypnosis, but they've been traumatized by the transition. We do it without traumatizing them. So yay for us for not traumatizing our clients when we get them into hypnosis. Good for us. I tried to explain this to the psychotherapist and they didn't respond. Um, so we want to get the idiomotor. We tell them to, to raise that finger and hold it, really feel that emotion until we just feel like they can't take it anymore. Then we tell them to inhale, release the emotion. So the PFC then switches from activation to suppression of the link between stimulus and emotion. And we use repetitions. Again, always the law of repetition. But we use a specific formulation. On the first pass, we just tell them when. And it may be done by taking them through a specific visualization of past experience or just appealing to deeply embedded subconscious conditioning. You know how to create this. You may have heard Dr. Kappas uses. You know how to create this emotion. You, you know, it's familiar to you. Just bring it up in whatever way you need to. This is important in cases where there is no acute trauma, where it's, where it's just as they've adapted to an environment, okay? And so, and so, you know, they know how to create it within themselves. They can bring it out, okay? But, but there may not be a specific event. And this is important. This is really important to understand this because what the military has learned is that if you train people in drills, in combat drills that assume a specific series of events, and they begin to get that scenario in front of them and the commander says, do this particular sequence of steps that we've been taught to do and something's different, the subconscious goes into major overdrive panic. Worst, it's, it's, it's the worst. This is why they talk about you don't do circle therapy on phobias because if you try to walk them through confronting the Boy Scouts and they're visualizing a certain situation and there's some difference there, the subconscious goes, whoa, 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 whoa. This, this is not what you taught me. This is not what you told me to expect, okay? 
And the actual, any difference actually breaks the whole thing down and they end up being worse off than they would have been if they hadn't had the, had the conditioning. So we need to recognize the difference between these two situations. So the suggestion is in the first pass, when the emotion is felt, allow the whatever left body part to rise. And then you release the motion, take a deep breath and pass and go deeper and reassert the resource state. Then you guide them back to their resource state, returning to that physical, emotional, moral state of ease and competence, okay? On the second repetition, we say, if the emotion is felt. So the subconscious now knows it has a choice. And quite often I get no reaction here. It's not unusual for me to get absolutely no reaction. The sub guy is like, yeah, yeah, I get this. I like my resource state. <laughs> I'm not leaving it, okay? If they still have a strong response, then you, on the third time, you do the if again, okay? If it's kind of a middling response or no response, then, in, then we use the law of reverse action and the third repetition. Try to create that emotion really try for the more you try the more you we know that this state of calm and and uh confidence and uh, uh leadership is what is desired and so most true within and so most real when expressed to the world try try harder for you find that the more you try, the more natural and right this resource state is within you. So again, that's why we did the arm rigidity thing. Okay, this is now familiar to them. Okay, so it's very easy for them to fall into this pattern. So this now gives the subconscious the authority, not only is this giving the PFC the ability to intervene, we're trying to give the subconscious the authority to internalize the chosen response as permanent conditioning so it's like you learned how to make O's and you had to think really hard about what you were doing with your hand muscles and everything like that. And then finally, it's just the subconscious does it for you automatically. In this last step, this try step, okay, we're giving the subconscious the authority. We're not only giving the conscious mind the ability to monitor and regulate and control, we're actually allowing the, giving the subconscious the choice to actually internalize this as permanent conditioning so that it is now a, um, it is, it is now uh, uh, done automatically, okay? So now what happens is if we, that, it, that's extinction. If you actually get to the point where you get extinction, um, you may not get there. If there's still a strong reaction in the third repetition, I'm sorry, in the second repetition, then you repeat that one. And we always try to come up with an in vivo experience to determine whether the reaction has been extinguished. So we send them out with home practice, go and do something which normally would trigger the reaction and find out what it's like, okay? And if they come in the next session, they sit they're still having unease, then we do the desensitization again. Okay, so now where did this come from? What's the client condition? Because this controls a lot about how we go about doing this process. Okay. The psychology of desensitization is always the same, but the subconscious choice for the limiting reaction, why the, be the behavior got established, comes, in it comes from different places and different circumstances. So we have to frame desensitization in a different way. So that freeze case that we talked about when we were talking about assessing affect, are they in submission? Okay. That's beyond the scope of the seminar. That takes a lot of work or can take a lot of work, okay? And, and sometimes I think it's, it's out of scope, okay? Where we would wanna have a partner in there. So epigenetic conditioning, chronic stress, illness or conflict, conditions the body to operate at a hypermetabolic set point. And then an external crisis then pushes the body over the edge into metabolic collapse. There's a book called Widen the Window, which talks about this. And many doctors diagnose this as depression or bipolar disorder. But what's really going on is the body is worn out. 
You've got a type A personality that's not listening to the body. And so they rest for a couple of weeks and then they get their energy back and then they go out into the world and they burn it up. So it looks like, looks like they're being manic. And then they collapse again. So they seem to be depressed because they can't do anything, but it's actually a metabolic process. It's just that the energy reserves in the body are so poor, are being mismanaged, okay? So, so this is a situation where you may have somebody come into your office and they've been diagnosed with depression, but it's actually a epigenetic conditioning and desensitization can help them, okay? But there's no coherent trigger for the limiting reaction. It's just any time there's a crisis, they go into blah, they collapse or they panic or whatever the heck it is, okay? So we desensitize to the emotions that go along with the collapse. So the suggestion is now turn to that emotion that undermines self-control. It is familiar to you. You know how to create it within you. Do that now using whatever image your memories may arise. Focus on the experience of that emotion. Let it build and let the left index finger signal when it is established, okay? And so you go, that's how you frame this. It's not to a specific set of experiences or events because it's random. And if you tell them, oh, we solved this, you know, that horrible experience that you had in the bookstore when the books fell over or when you knocked the, the, the book display over and everybody was, the child started screaming and hit a child and it started screaming and everything when, you know, cat, cattywampus, okay. If you desensitize them to that experience and use that as a trigger, well, the next time something else happens, it's just going to be worse. Okay? You can't use a specific trigger. You have to give them control. And all of the things we talked about earlier, the normalization, the, you know, the understanding metabolic state, knowing how to calm themselves down and recognizing that they are operating at this high set point, getting them doing the body scan and getting them really, really relaxed, which helps to turn off that set point and bring that set point down. All of this is going to help these people. Okay, very, very powerful therapy. Okay, when you get the replacement established, how do we do the replacement? Or when you, once you get once it's extinguished, okay. So this should be once fully extinguished. <laughs> once the reaction is fully extinguished, excuse me. We want to assert the replacement. So this new self-control empowers connection and fulfillment. And you give them family, socially at work, and you allow them 30 or so seconds just to visualize the change in each area. Just this, 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 just this little self-guided imagery journey in each of the three areas of life, because it's everywhere in their lives. This is going to affect everywhere in their lives. Fear. Okay, so fear, which as you know, is a specific sequence of events triggers the reaction. So now what we do in this case, as you know, circle therapy, you actually get the details of what happened. The mind, the subconscious is ruminating on the experience. It knows exactly what's happened. You get them to cough up the experience and then you walk them through the experience step by step. And when the finger comes up, pass it and release it. Reassert the resource state, take them back to the beginning, walk them up again to that point, okay? And usually you get further and further and further, and you just keep on going and going and going until you get to the very end and they can pass through the entire experience and there's no reaction, okay? And then there's always some cost to not being able to go on that airplane or, or make that presentation, okay? And, and you've gone through the specific benefits that are blocked by that limiting response. Okay, that's the, that's the replacement. Give them that replacement, okay? Visualizing all those benefits of now being able to drive and go, go, go and pick that girl up or, or, you know, make that, do that camping trip or, or go to Hawaii or whatever the heck they need to do. Okay. Phobia. So generally speaking, we we always get introduced to phobias as a, a, a hypoglycemic issue, a hypoglycemic attack. Okay. But in general, a phobia arises when the subconscious mind has lost confidence in the capacity of the conscious mind or the self-concept to maintain safety in the waking world. So this could be a situation where, okay, we got a job and our boss is screaming at us and we don't leave. Or we're in a relationship and we're really unhappy and we're really in love with somebody else. 
but we stay there anyways, even though our romantic partner knows that we're not there for them and they get angry. And we choose to stay there. Okay, there's lots of situations, okay, in which the subconscious mind loses confidence in the capacity of the conscious mind to maintain safety in the waking world. And so quite often, even in situations of abuse, whether it be psychological or physical, the primary issue may actually be that the subconscious mind has lost trust in the ability of the, comp of the conscious mind to take actions to create safety. That the trust is not with the other person and, and that I can never trust anybody again, it's not trusting ourselves. Okay, so by walking them through this situation, okay, we're preparing the subconscious to accept that, that we will, that we've, we've activated these virtues and we're gonna use these virtues to protect ourselves, okay? Now, the thing is that because of this loss of confidence, because the subconscious is nine times more powerful than the, than the conscious mind, okay, quite often the client will come in in hypersuggestibility and environmental hypnosis, okay? And now it's walking around in this dangerous waking world that it doesn't really know how to manage terribly well because it's relied upon the self-concept to do that for decades and decades, okay? What it does is it just uses the limiting response again and again and again until you're in, you know, lying in bed in a darkened room with the covers over your head, the windows closed and the doors and the beds in the farthest corner from the door. Okay, you, you've got agoraphobia, you can't do anything. Okay, so recognizing this. So the challenge here is to restore proper balance between the conscious and subconscious mind. So we build that self-trust. We don't wanna focus on the specific sequence of events because that's what the conscious mindset was going on, but the subconscious knows it's different. It's this trust issue. So you don't want to choose a specific experience. We know that from combat training, any deviation from that sequence triggers a loss of confidence, even a bigger loss of confidence in conscious discernment, and the limiting reaction is worse, leading eventually even to paralysis, as in the 401 case you know, videos. So in theory, theory for phobia, we use the framing of conical therapy. We're, we're going to do this ranking of triggers, of situations that creates the comfort. One is total comfort. That's the base of the cone. Ten is curled up in a ball in the corner, totally incapable of reacting to whatever is going on around us. That's the point of the cone. Okay. And we want to find something of which is around like a four where they're anxious, but still capable of responding to events. So there's the subconscious can accept that, yeah, the conscious mind is still there with me and it does pretty well in this circumstance, okay? We do desensitization as with fear in that situation. And you also what the such for when you wanna pick something they can do in the next week. And you send them out to actually do that. And then the next week you come back and you see how they did. And usually it's like, it's zero now. I can do, a, or it's you know, one or zero. I use, I always use zero. HMI likes to use one as the base of the, uh, it's kind of like no response, but I, I, I like to go for zero for whatever reason. But anyways, so I go for zero and um, uh, they come in and they say it's zero. So now you do the ranking all over again. You find a new four that they can do the next week. Send them out to do it. Okay. And then when you finally get to extinguished where they no longer have a 10. Because that 10 was something that was a fabric of their imagination. They've obviously probably never been in that situation where they're with the terrorist in the elevator, <laughs> with the 10 terrorists in the elevator and, and the bomb is ticking, okay? You know, they've never been in that situation. Well, what happens is eventually the, the subconscious says, you know, this is a stupid game that we're playing, okay? Let's, let's just forget about it and move forward because it feels safe. Again, remember that always the subconscious is looking for a, a, a solution and in dreams it will eventually vent things out and pass it forward. Okay, that's the framing part. This is, this, is, this is the difficult issue. And again, this is complicated. I've tried to break this out into categories. When you're working with a client, 
It's going in, just don't go in blind. If you know it's a fear of phobia, you want to, you want to just make sure, I'm sorry, if you know it's a, it's an issue where they've got a limiting reaction that they're struggling with. Okay. When did it start? Okay. How bad does it get? Is it in a specific situation or not? Okay. Just, just get enough information. And, and all you need to do is just kind of like get the categories lined out. You know, the view graphs are great. You don't need all, all this deep understanding. And, and you go into the session knowing what you need to focus in the discovery process. Okay. And you know which one of these three routes you're going to take in terms of desensitization. And you know when to bail out if you have to and say, we really need more help with this. Now, the thing is that if you get into that point, remember just getting them hypnotized, doing the body scan, reconnecting the mind and the body, okay? That's gonna help whoever they work with, whoever they get referred to, because they're gonna have hope that they can feel good again about themselves, okay? So I would always recommend in the first session, you know, if you say that this, this, is, this is complicated, but I wanna just give the experience of hypnosis, always doing that, always doing that for them on the first session, okay? So any questions on this part of the presentation? The, and I'll get this posted up. Um, I will uh, convert this and get it up on YouTube so that you can hear the full dialogue and discussion. And I will put uh, the view graphs up in a place where they'll be available as well. Um, so um, any questions, anyone? No, did this work for you tonight? Yeah, that was really helpful. Thank you. Okay, so so what I'm what I would uh, appreciate is is if you've enjoyed it and found it valuable, um, if you could when I put up the the links to all the resources in the um, hypnosis and work practice and workshops group, if you would like the post, um, and um, also on my um, Google business page, any kind of recommendations. If you want to put a recommendation up, just let me know. And um, I'll send you a link to that so that you can get out there and throw something up. Um, again, um, as I said, this work is so very, very important. This, this, this effort that we have invested in empowering people to create themselves and to uh, feel in charge of their lives. Um, I'm always humbled to speak before people that have chosen this work. And I hope that you benefit from what I presented here tonight. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Welcome. That was so good. I mean, I was like, I usually can't sit through things very long. And that was like, I'm, I'm right there with you the whole time going, yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> so it was really good. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That, yeah, you're, you're quite welcome. That thank you for saying that, Laura. Yeah. Yeah, I have a client right now who I'm doing attempt. I mean, I'm going to do this sensitization with him. So, yeah, and, and, <clears throat> so and, this and is I, awesome. Yeah, and, and and the thing is that you know it's you have to you have to take that first section in the in the uh, in the document. I'm sorry, the second section where I talk about the steps, and you have mm -hmm. to actually pull the little things out and put them in the right places. So, so, so you know. Um, I, I, I do different things in different situations. Um, and I am a collaborative hypnotherapist, which means that there's a lot of intuition involved mm -hmm. in what I focus on in the process. Um, but, you know, when I, when I did my first few clients, I went back to my 401 essay answers and tried to find a corresponding case to draw upon. Mm -hmm. um, and so, over time, this is, this, I distilled this as kind of a general framework. Um, this is, yeah, this is I like to pretty have challenging it. I mean, work, the though. framework, it's great, you know, because then if I know it logically, then I can relax a little and apply my, like you were saying, the intuitive aspect of therapy. And, and so then I can, yeah, basically but, for me to relax. If I know it logically, then I can relax in the session and do it more intuitively. You know. Gosh, that's so beautifully put. <laughs> that's such a profound statement. You know, that, that knowing the theory of what's going on 
limits the possibilities and it channels your attention in ways that enable you to be more effective. So, well so, said, yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just so powerful. Um, but it is still this, as I, you know, as I said, this is the foundation of, of personal development through hypnotherapy. Okay. So it, it kind of like, it, it can get involved into almost any situation. Um, and that's why it's complicated It's because you're tapping into the power of their own mind to heal and to be, and to learn to, to be in control of itself. Um, and, and so, um, what also happens here is that it opens up so many doors for clients. So it's just incredibly rewarding work because they now know that they can conquer, they can conquer the mountain, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, really like powerful. even in the case with, uh, when you're saying that, that made sense because the case that I'm coming up on here, he's, you know, seeing, viewing his reaction as control, right. The angry right. Uh, politics sort of thing. That's, that's his reaction. It right. seems like it's control. But like you said, this is actually what we're doing is helping them gain control, real, actual, legitimate control. Right. And, but, and, and the control is that they're using more of their mind. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. not allowing this one part of their mind to their run resources. off and, and, and mm -hmm. control everything mm -hmm. else. It's, it's, it's just bringing mm -hmm. more of their mind to the situation. Um, and, and, you know, anger is, is, a, real, is a real hard one. Um, Anger is a, um, uh, it's just a very, very selfish emotion where you, where you, you project into the world that, that the people around you don't deserve anything. And so you mm -hmm. can ignore them and discount them as human beings. Um, yeah. And it's related. Like he says, he has control over all other areas of his life, like in business as a business leader and all that. But when it comes to politics, he's a loose cannon. So Right. He doesn't like that. <laughs> right. And that's, so, I mean, look at the environment we're in now, you know, I mean, like you even started off on that, you know, on that note and it's, it's definitely applicable. I mean. And, and some of the things, you know, that, that I think I spoke about, or maybe not this time about the book, the culture code, um, mm -hmm. which really uh, attacks head on this myth that it is the dominant personality that creates successful organizations. Mm. Um, so um, one of the things that, that that book convicted me of, and I put it, there's a book re review for it up on my website, convicted me of is that, is that um, what he's describing, what Daniel Coyle is describing in that book are conditions under which people are entranced when they're at work. It's like being in love. They love their work. They love the people at work. They feel like family. These are all these are all terms that, that they they use when talking about work. Um, is that they feel really safe there, and so they don't need that protection of the critical mind. So part of what happens when you've got an environment, and he talks about football coaches specifically with or basketball coaches specifically with regards to this, you know, um, and and the balance between that. You know, getting people into trance so they can play at peak performance, processing all the information in the field instantaneously by throwing them in front of the bus of the coach's anger. <laughs> making them feel really safe and that they're all together. And if they can't do what they need to do themselves, there's somebody there right next to them who's going to help them. And, you know, and they're going to learn something from it. That play doesn't work. Don't run that one again. <laughs> okay, let's do something different next time, guys. Okay, all these things are resilience and hardiness. Okay, and they're all, they're all implicit in Coyle's book. He, I think that he brings in resilience at one point in time, but it actually has more of the flavor of what I call hardiness. Okay. But that's that's a very if, if you're dealing with somebody who's convicted that dominance is the key to organizational success, um, that's a really good yeah. book to turn them on to. Well, I just got the last book you recommended too, so I'm which one was that? To that? Um, gosh, now I can't remember. Hold on, I have it on my. The one before that was um, um, hang on, the, the quick fix. The quick fix? I think that's it. Well, hold on here. Oh God, that was a depressing book. It is. The quick fix. <laughs> I know. Great. No, I've been listening to it and it is very interesting. I mean, it is, yeah. you know, so I can, you know, read through something and 
and take and leave whatever you know but well the thing that was mm -hmm. the thing i felt very vulnerable writing that book review because we mm -hmm. just had that positive psychology speaker for the for the <laughs> for the aa program and she was also yeah. big about Martin Seligman. And I'm reading this up with Michael. Like my hair's on fire. You know, really. Well, you, did you know, this. when I was in, <laughs> I graduated college. Like I went later. So I was, I did my psychology degree mm, like 15 or so years ago. And mm -hmm. positive psychology was kind of the same as that the book is describing it. That's the yeah. way we thought of it. That's the way my teacher, my professor thought of it. You know, oh, then so it was it the superficial. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you think of 15 years ago, we didn't have constant positivity memes and all that kind of stuff on social media all the time. Mm -hmm. And so it aligns with how I learned positive psychology okay. when I was in school. So well, that's it's not a far stretch for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a culture change, you know, I mean, yeah. around positivity. So, yeah. Well, but the thing is, the thing is that, you know, I read Coyle's books and I, and I put this up on students and grads. Read these books. If you really want to, to, to see how positive psychology works, read these freaking books. Because, you know, it's like, um, uh, he's not talking about one limited specific situation. It's, he's, he's looking at lots of different contexts and saying that these things are in common. Um, so for personal excellence, he looks at, you know, the KIPP program, high school graduation in disadvantaged communities. He looks at, tennis, he looks at music, he looks at um, uh, chess, I think. I mean, there's just, just a huge number of situations that he looks at. And that, that book is all about myelin. So, and so again, that view graph I had, I do that in the simplifying suggestibility, but there's just certain things that, that I, 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 I try to draw out every now and then, which is that, you know, one of the things that the theory of mind that we have, um, and part of the reason I'm so invested in kind of updating it a little bit, um, is a narrative about personal, about, about life and personal growth. And, and, you know, one of the things that I found is surprising is having kind of uh, charted out that course by giving a hypnotherapist view of the chakras and kind of putting in folksy terms, you know, I'll take my clients through that and I'll say, you know, you're kind of, your, your lived experience has been down here in the lower chakras and, and you've had a lot of pain because you're, you're learning and we hurt each other in situations like that and nobody really knows what the hell's going on. So do you want to go back and fix that stuff or you want to go up over here? And, and seven times out of 10, it's, I want to go up here. Just, just forget that old stuff. Okay teach me how to be that way and and i don't need to i don't need to worry about this other stuff because the reason why i'm concerned about that other stuff is because it's blocking me from getting there so so just take me there and if i and if i need to look at some old issues i i look into it um but um quite often we don't really need to deal with past history even with people who have had serious childhood trauma you know um I tell them what the story is, where we're going. I say, you know, I re can't really talk in detail and help you with some of the things that you happened in your childhood. I get, I get the sense as to what, what it was like, but I can help you believe in yourself because I can see in you that you care. That's part of why you hurt so much, okay, that you do care. And so let's focus on that and let's make that real in the world. And, and you know, what happens in most of these situations is I end up doing pro bono after the first 10 sessions or something like that. Because quite often there are people that are carrying a lot of, a lot of stuff around with them and they have trouble with, uh, with uh, abundance. So, um, but it's among the most rewarding work that I do. My voice is getting worn out. I wanna do what Patricia is doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cuddled up. Yeah, I'm ready for that. And uh, thank you all for being here with me tonight. I do appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.